All right, so to sort of kick things off, for those of us who aren't as familiar with Rainbow Black, would you mind giving us like a basic rundown of its premise? Sure. Well, it's, um, I guess it's historical fiction. It's 1990 and it's, it's based on um, or inspired by the real life case of the McMartins, which was, or the, <laughs> inspired by the satanic panic, which is a real life phenomenon that happened um, in the 1980s where all over America, people started to believe that preschool teachers were in a, a national conspiracy of pedophiles. And if you trace the origins of this hysteria, um, it's mostly traceable to a book called Michelle Remembers, which was written by a um, psychiatrist in Canada. So that's another weird thing that actually started in Canada, not in America. And he claimed, he had a sort of a dubious claim that he could unearth repressed memories and that his patient um, together through this, these strange therapy techniques, she had uncovered buried memories that she was abused as a child by Satanists. And this catapulted into this nationwide hysteria. People were afraid to send their children to, to preschool. And um, there was a real, there were real life charges. Uh, the McMartin preschool trials last about eight years. Millions of dollars were spent trying to throw these little old ladies into prison. Um, they hadn't done anything. And eventually they were exonerated, but not before their business was destroyed. So anyway, the book is um, set during the Satanic Panic and based on um, the McMartin trial. Cool. Well, not cool, but interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, and so from that little synopsis, um, for those of us who aren't as familiar, um, it is a very heavy book that deals with some very sensitive issues, um, like the Satanic Panic, like you mentioned, as well as um, LGBTQ rights, um, especially in the sort of recent past, um, as well as the foster care system and the criminal justice system. Um, what inspired you to tackle those topics and write a book like this? Uh, well, I knew I wanted to write um, about the Satanic Panic. I'm very interested in um, scapegoats, the way, in any situation where um, we target an individual with our collective dread and anxiety about something, um, really interests me, especially since when we have these social uproars, almost always it consumes us for a while. It consumes our news feeds and then we just forget. We throw it away. But the person that was scapegoated has to carry that with them for the rest of their lives. And especially now with the internet, once your name is sullied and linked to something, it's very hard to reclaim your identity. So it was important to me to have a queer protagonist because it is a story about identity and... Um, Puritanism and, you know, New England. There's a lot of charged history in New England with witch hunts. So it all just kind of came together all the thematically. Right. Um, so you mentioned New England. Um, and of course, being a native New Englander, I'm definitely interested in all that. Um, so what is the significance in the book of both um, New Hampshire, Montreal, and sort of Canaan, which is a town in Vermont, you know, as settings for your book? What sort of inspired you to put the story here? Well, I knew it had to be set in New Hampshire because, um, and I'm, I'm not a New Hampshireite, I'm from the South, but from the moment I heard that New Hampshire's uh, motto was live free or die, I was just very enamored of New Hampshire. And, you know, I just, I love the existentialism inherent in that motto. It's like live free or die, but it's like, are you going to die? Are you <laughs> Like, is it going to be the second one? You know, like there's there's something very fatalistic about it that I enjoy. Um, but and then the rivalry between Vermont and New Hampshire is really interesting to me. <laughs> and then you have this third party in the triumvirate of Montreal, which is, you know, two hours away. But they're speaking literally a different language. They have a very different history, you know, Canada wasn't settled, uh, an equally violent history, but they, Canada wasn't settled by Puritans, it was settled by Catholic settlers, 
So you just have a very different vibe there, a much more of like a Catholic darkness than a, a more medieval spooky feeling there than here you have more of like a witch burning Puritan darkness. So I wanted to just show them and, and really show that um, we see Canada as this perfect land that we all wish we could escape to sometimes, but it is just as um, flawed as America in some ways. Um, maybe not just as, but um, so yeah, I just, I just wanted to show all these three places um, and how they intersect and how they differ. And how, you know, this the character is continually trying to escape, but can never really escape herself. Right, which is, it's a very kind of New England story of, you know, wanting to leave, but always kind of being ensnared and never really being able to go. Um, which... Do you feel misunderstood? Is Like, when you, whenever you try to leave New England, do you always feel like, well, I just don't belong here. I have to yes. go back. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. Um and you mentioned identity a little bit ago, and that is definitely a huge theme throughout the book, um, both the changing of identities, um, the obscuring of identities, and the search kind of for identity, because all of this happens when Lacey is very, very young. So did Lacey and the other kind of secondary protagonist, Dylan, did their characters kind of drive those decisions and those explorations, or... Did you kind of use them as a way to explore that? I guess, did did their characterization drive it or was that something you always kind of wanted to talk about? Yeah, that's a good question. I personally am a writer. I'm very character first. So the char the I love character and I love themes. And then the plot is always the thing I care least about. So once I have my character, my themes, the plot just kind of finds its way. Awesome. Um, I can definitely relate to being kind of character first. I find plot very difficult. Plot I'm always just really like, tricky. I have this, I have this cool character. Why do, why does something have to happen? Right. <laughs> but this book, I really tried to flex my plotting muscles because you know the the plot we start fast and there is a lot of plot that I try to cram into this 400 pages. Yeah, and it definitely works. It, you know, keeps go it keeps coming and it kind of keeps you on your toes um, as a reader. Um, so your background is in young adult fiction. Um, and this is your first foray kind of into adult fiction. Um, did you notice any similarities and differences between writing each one? And is there one you prefer? I would say um, I, I sort of doing my training in young adult, um, was a good space for me because young adult literature is a space where it is, um, acceptable and in fact, mandatory to believe in true love. And I'm a romantic. I believe in true love. I really do believe love conquers all. And some people see Rainbow Black as a very like dark and hopeless tale, but I, I see it as a love conquers all tale. And I think that my background in YA, um, hopefully that sort of shines through. But, um, you know, a, I think adult is adult literature is more where my heart is and probably where I will stay. Um, YA, it's, there's too much pressure to keep up with trends and the trends are merciless. They come fast, they come hard you'll see that for like five years, all the covers look the same and it feels like all the content is the same. And I just, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. It's if you're a trend spotter who can then get really excited about what's coming next and like try to beat the trend, you can do really well in YA. But um, my process is too slow and I think my process is too just kind of individual, um, I feel like I can't, I feel like I'm drowning in YA a lot of the time. Whereas in adult, I feel like I can breathe. Mm -hmm. Which is very understandable. Um, so there's a lot of sort of recent history in this book. Um, and there's a, you talk about a lot of different things. Um, what, what was the research and the preparation for both like the social and the cultural history aspect? as well as there's a lot about like the legal system and sort of the legal process. Um, so what did that sort of whole process journey look like? 
Well, my, my father is a federal judge, so I have a lot of just kind of experience around courtrooms. I used to go to work with him a lot and just sit and watch the trials and watch the proceedings. And I found, always found it really interesting. And my dad is this very, you know, as you can imagine, this very stern, quiet, mysterious figure. Um, so I feel like I naturally have a like a legalistic mind just from growing up with a judge for a parent. Um, in terms of the cultural research, I just watched, I watched so much TV. I watched maybe 50 hours of Days of Our Lives because there's a lot of Days of Our Lives references in the book and I wanted to make sure I was getting everything. I wanted everything to be really specific. So I watched the entire, um, I watched every episode of Days of Our Lives that aired during the summer that the book takes place. I also watched a lot of um, commer uh, vintage commercial compilations on YouTube so I could really just get the feel for what the messaging was in 1990 um, when Lacey is going through all of this. And then um, in 2006, so there's a 14-year time jump or 16-year time jump. We move forward. Um, and that was a little, because I remember 2006. Like I was there. I was, a, I was an adult. Um, so that I could do more from memory. But uh, basically just watched like a lot of trashy TV, That's watched awesome. a lot of clips of talk shows. <laughs> awesome. And then I read a lot of court documents, too. You can read the McMartin trial court documents and just see, you know, you can look at the arguments that the two sides were making. Um, and that, that was a really great resource as well. That's really, really, um, really, really unconventional and really, really cool. <laughs> um, so is there a particular... And I love asking this question. Is there a particular part of writing Rainbow Black or a particular part of the novel itself that you're most proud of? Either it's something, you know, in the book that you're really happy with or like a challenge you had to overcome while um, you were writing it. I'm very proud of um, how I conducted myself in the revision process because this book is 400 pages. It used to be 800 pages. Wow. And in revisions with an, with an editor that was brought on, because um, my agent saw the potential of this, but was like, this needs while a huge amount of editing. Uh, we cut the book in half. And, you know, that's, that is a difficult thing to do, to just slash and slash and slash. But I really treated it almost like a sport. I was like, I, I gave myself the nickname, The Slasher, <laughs> and I would just like slash and I would slash whole pages, whole paragraphs. And it came out, you know, I think being a much more uh, commercial book because not many people are really down to read an 800 page tome these days, mm -hmm. but it also made it a better book. There's no w world in which I think that that 800 page version is better than this. So I was glad I could kind of get over myself and just slash. Yeah. Yeah. Letting go is really hard, but a lot of the time it's really, really worth it. Um, is there a particular character in the book that resonates most with you or one of the characters that you feel has the biggest part of yourself in them? I feel like I'm, I'm a very, um, for people who haven't read the book yet, you know, our, our narrator is Lacey, who's a very down to earth, diligent, um, you know, she's a reader. She's a very serious person. And then she is very juxtaposed by her sister, her older sister, Eclair, who is kind of a wild child. And I would say there's parts of me in both of them. Um, my mind works more like Lacey's mind. Um, but I definitely have Eclair's uh, appetite for uh, self-destruction. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I'm not very, I'm not as patient as Lacey is. I'm not as good at doing homework. I'm much more indulgent. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of spread around in a lot of the characters. That makes sense. Um, so what would you say are your biggest inspirations and your influences, both literary wise and, you know, if Days of Our Lives really speaks to you, um, what works of any kind would you say have kind of shaped you as a creator and, you know, what you are creating and what you plan to create. I mean, I love, um, I love legal thrillers. I love 
Lifetime movies. I love Days of Our Lives. I love Donna Tartt. I love The Goldfinch. I love Twilight. I love anything that is um, romantic, but not completely vapid. So I feel like, I, but I, I really love, um, there's something about Lifetime movies that really speak to me. I think it's, it's being unapologetically dramatic is something I really am trying to embrace more. I think I, my writing, I can sometimes be like a little neurotic and a little cerebral and I'm always trying to just challenge myself to like, go for the drama, go for the drama. That's awesome. Um, so I'm sure everyone is very anxious to know what you're working on now. Um, anything in the pipeline or something that you're thinking about? It's been a, the, in the last two years, I have written the first 100 pages of um, three different novels that then I had to abandon because oh. uh, it, it just wasn't it. And it's like, I'm, I think I've hit on the new it. Um, but I only hit on it like a week ago. <laughs> but I, you know, I think um, I tried one of my attempts was a detective novel. One and then two others were about lawyers because I love writing about lawyers. Uh, but so I don't I can't say exactly what's happening next, but it's. My process is always like this for every book that I have published, there are five that are just sitting in a hard drive on my computer and that will probably never see the light of day. I've written a vampire novel. I've written like four detective novels. <laughs> I've written, um, oh, I wrote a werewolf novel. I forgot about that one. Like there, I have books that I literally, I wrote a, um, a book about a oil executive. Like I just, I have all these books and they'll never, they'll, most of them will never see the light of, the, of day. And I wish I could be the type of writer who just, has a really good inner compass as to like what the next big, big thing is. But for me, I have to experiment. I have to make, I have to have a lot of failures <laughs> before I have a success. And I've accepted that about myself. Yeah, you got to trust the process. Yeah, I mean, my process is very annoying, <laughs> but I, it's all I have. Like I, if I could change, I would. But um, we are who we are. And is there anything that you're reading right now that you'd like to talk about, um, you know, that has really spoken to you recently or an old favorite that you've picked up? I was really surprised. Um, has anyone read the new Brett Easton Ellis that came out last year? It was very, very inspiring to me. It feels like we all knew who Brett Easton Ellis was as a writer. And then all of a sudden he came out with this new book, The Shards that revealed so much more like it's a really juicy book because it feels like it's like secrets revealed and that was really inspiring to me that after you know that maybe one day people will think they've got me pinned down and then i'll write something like the shards that just makes everyone question everything <laughs> i would really i would really recommend it awesome. and it was a mystery too it's a murder mystery and it it's it it grabs right on the first page I think it's a good, I, I think the Shards and Rainbow Black go extremely well together. They're like a good, they're a good pair.